Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we're looking at a piece of a nuclear reactor, specifically the fuel channel from a can-do reactor. If you'd like to learn more about that particular design and its history, please check out my previous video on the subject which I will link to in the description below. Now, like the cladding on the fuel and a couple of other components in the reactor, the fuel channels of the can-do are made of an alloy called zircaloy which is composed mainly of zirconium along with around 2.5% niobium. And the reason that alloy is used is because it has a very low neutron cross-section, meaning it absorbs very few neutrons and thus doesn't interfere with the nuclear chain reaction, which is especially important in a reactor like the CANDU, which uses unenriched natural uranium and thus must maintain a very high neutron economy. Now, neutron cross-section is actually a rather interesting concept because it's measured in a unit called a barn which is equivalent to 10 to the negative 28 meters squared, or around 100 femtometers squared, the approximate cross-sectional area of an atom of uranium. And I say interesting because neutron cross-section isn't actually a literal measure of cross-sectional area, but rather of probability. The probability that a neutron will interact with a particular material, whether it will be captured and induce a fission, whether it will be absorbed, or whether it will be scattered. And the best, I think, illustration, best analogy for how this connection works is if you were to actually hang up a bunch of large spheres, say basketballs or beach balls or something like that, in a regular pattern across a wall and then try to throw a small ball at them. The larger the spheres are, the smaller the gaps between them, the more likely you are to actually hit them. Thus you get the connection between cross-sectional area and probability of interaction. And this is important because Neutron cross-section doesn't usually have anything to do with literal size of the atoms being interacted with. To give you an example, regular light water, uh, the water that we deal with every day, has a neutron cross-section of about 0.66 barns. It's a very efficient neutron absorber. Heavy water, on the other hand, which is water where one or both of the hydrogens has been replaced with deuterium, a heavy isotope of hydrogen with one extra neutron, has a neutron cross-section of 0.0013 barns, 500 times smaller. Yet the two molecules are about the same size. Now the name of the unit, the barn, is a pretty funny one because it's not actually named after a person or anything like that as you might expect, but rather comes from the expression can't hit the broad side of a barn. The idea being that from the point of view of a neutron, a uranium nucleus is so massive that it can't possibly miss it, like the broad side of a barn. And that term was invented by scientists working for the Manhattan Project during World War II that produced the world's first atomic bomb. And it wouldn't be the last bizarre term of art that they would coin. In nuclear and particle physics, there's another unit called the shake, which is 10 to the negative 8 seconds, or around 10 nanoseconds. And that's the average time between neutron generations in a nuclear chain reaction. And that term, the shake, comes from the expression two shakes of a lamb's tail, so a very short unit of time really shows you what kind of people nuclear physicists are. Now, although its low neutron cross-section makes zirconium extremely useful for use in nuclear reactors, it does have a number of disadvantages. One of these is that at high temperatures, zirconium tends to react readily with water to produce hydrogen gas. And indeed, this is one of the many mechanisms that contributed to the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Even after you've shut down a nuclear reactor, after you've stopped the chain reaction, you still need to actively cool the core. And this is because when uranium fissions, it splits into a number of smaller nuclei called fission products that are highly radioactive elements that produce a lot of decay heat. If you don't cool the core, the decay heat from these fission products will build up and then cause the cladding on the fuel to melt, leading to a meltdown. And when the fuel in a reactor becomes spent, becomes depleted, and needs to be removed, it is first placed in a cooling pond where those fission products can decay away and the decay heat can dissipate before those fuel bundles can finally be placed in dry storage. And during the Fukushima disaster, after the earthquake and the resulting tsunami wiped out all the generators and the electrical power supply, it also knocked out the cooling pumps to the spent fuel cooling ponds. And that fuel then heated up, reacted with the water to produce a lot of hydrogen. That hydrogen built up and finally exploded and blew the roof off the complex. 
Now another disadvantage of using zirconium is that it's highly susceptible to something called hydrogen embrittlement, which is a type of corrosion where a metal reacts with hydrogen in its environment, especially if it's immersed in something like hot water, to produce a compound called a metal hydride. And metal hydrides tend to be extremely brittle, so as they build up on the component, if that component is subject to a lot of stress, say a fuel channel or a coolant pipe or something like that, it will eventually crack and rupture. And indeed, the study of that particular process is how I came to own this sample. Now, a few of you might know this, but up until very recently, when I became a YouTube writer full-time, I actually worked as an engineer. And one of my very first jobs straight out of university was working on a small project with a professor of mine that was being run by Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, or AECL, out in Chalk River Laboratories, Ontario. And what they wanted to do was to study hydrogen embrittlement in a lab setting. And they had a piece of lab equipment that they'd been using for ages where they would take these little specially cut samples, place them in a heated compartment full of hydrogen, apply stress, and then leave them like that for weeks, and then study how the cracks formed. This is a very old piece of equipment, they wanted something new, something a little bit more capable, so that's what I was assigned with designing. And I'm going to bring up some of the drawings that I have left over from that project here. What I ended up doing was taking their original design, which was actually horizontal, and flipping it 90 degrees so that now the sample was held vertically. So the sample was in a chamber that had heating elements and could be filled with hydrogen. And there was a rod sticking out the top, and that rod could be acted upon by two different linear stepper motors. One of them could pull vertically, providing a linear stress, whereas the other one would push the rod from the side, providing a bending moment. But the biggest engineering challenge in this project was how to insert and remove the sample without imparting too much stress on it. If you think about it, at the end of the experiment, after the sample has been exposed to hydrogen and heat for a very long time, it's going to be very brittle. And if you need to apply too much force to it in order to remove it from the device, you're going to induce cracking that wasn't there before, and you're not going to be able to tell that cracking from the cracking that was induced during the experiment itself, and the whole experiment is ruined. So the solution I came up with is something I'm actually still quite proud of. This is a 3D printed representation of the mechanism. And this would actually be machined into a much larger block of metal, but to save on plastic I just made this very slimmed down representation. So in this block of metal you would have a U-shaped channel cut into it, another little U-shaped channel up here, and then a cross pin pushed through. And then this little hook would actually be attached to the sample on one side, and on the other side of the sample you would have a rod. Now, to insert the sample, you would push this entire assembly through a little hole in the top of the chamber, and then hook the hook around the pin, and push it forward until it locked. So what you'd have here is an assembly where you could actually put a lot of stress vertically. You could pull on the sample, you could bend the sample from this direction, it wouldn't go anywhere, but when you wanted to remove the sample, all you needed to do was take this and gently tip it back. It would unhook, you could pull it out. And that can be done with very little force and this would not damage the sample. So, oh, neat little solution if I do say myself. So in the end, nothing really came of this project. ACL liked the design, but decided instead to keep using their original equipment and didn't want to spend money on something new. So all that's left of it now are those drawings, this sample, and this little piece of 3D printing. But anyways, there you have it. Uh, not only a very interesting little piece of Canadian nuclear history, but also the remnants of my very first job as an engineer. So that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at yet another fascinating artifact just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier. Have a great day.